other countries as well. Good. And we'll be starting in just a little bit. Welcome everybody on behalf of Holocaust Museum Los Angeles. My name is Michael Morgenstern and I'm an educator at the museum. This morning I'm pleased to welcome you to our discussion with Ben Lesser, a Holocaust survivor from Poland. For those of you who have not been to the museum before, Holocaust Museum Los Angeles is the first Holocaust survivor founded Holocaust Museum in the United States. In the 1960s, a group of survivors worked together to create a memorial for their loved ones who perished in the Holocaust. And this memorial eventually became Holocaust Museum Los Angeles. These survivors who with a mission to inspire future generations. Furthermore, should always be free to the first education one able to be in our museums we are still able to carry this more privilege of listening to Ben with you and type in questions in the Q for those watching on Facebook and I'm all daughter Gail lesser us as well um, for the with um, share some of his so it's them both of you Ben lived in Los Angeles and as he will probably mention he currently lives in Las Vegas he has spoken at our museum um, quite a few times when he's been in Los Angeles and for the time being, we're able to do this with the Zoom. So uh, I'm so happy to welcome both Ben and Gail and Ben, you may start sharing your story. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. Thank you, Michael. Uh, yes, Los Angeles Museum is my uh, home. I think the first time I talked, started to talk, I went to the museum and told my story. But things have changed since then, and I'd like to um, bring you all up to date. I come to you from an era in history where civilization lost its humanity, its heart. A time when there were only three kinds of people in this world. There were the, the victims, the killers, and the bystanders. The whole world stood by idly, and they didn't say a word. They allowed it to happen. I was born in Krakow, Poland, to a wonderful family of seven. My wonderful father, my mother, my sister, Goldie, and I had another sister. She's not on this photograph. My little brother, Tuli, and my oldest brother, Moishi. None of these people that you see on this screen have survived. Every one of them was slaughtered by the Nazis. We're having a little problems with the pictures. Um, forgive me, it's a little hot where I'm talking. I have to take off my sweater. It was cold a little while ago. Um, anyway, all those people that you see on the photo rev did not survive, they were all slaughtered. The only survivors were my sister Lola and I. 
just the two of us survived. Everyone else was slaughtered. We lived in a beautiful um, building on a major, major thoroughfare in Krakow. And on the um, lower ground floor, um, these three windows were part of my, part of our family's apartment. The last window was my bedroom window. And I remember one early in the morning, well, let's not talk about this for now. Um, I just want to bring you up to date a little bit about my family. My father had a beautiful um, chocolate factory, and he was the first person to make chocolate covered wafers like Kit Kat but it was in the shape of little animals and they were tin foil covered. And I remember whenever my father would come home, us kids would check his, search his pockets and see if we can find the candy. Usually he had enough in there for every member of the family. He also had a wine and syrup factory where he manufactured kosher, wine and syrup, both of those businesses were confiscated from him um, by the Nazis. In uh, Krakow, I remember just as the war broke out, um, the fifth day after occupation of the city, a truck pulls up to the gate of the building where we lived and they started to bang. And when the um, super came to open the door, it was 5 a.m. in the morning. What's going, was it, what's going on? So you saw a truck full of soldiers. Uh, I don't know if they were assessment or regular soldiers and all they wanted to know where the Jewish people lived. And in this building, there were two uh, Jewish families. One, uh, we were on one side, and the other side on the ground floor was another young couple with two daughters. And the mother gave birth to a infant um, little boy about two months earlier. The girls were about my age because I remember when we came home from school, we would play in the yard. So after he opened the gate and he, they wanted to know where the Jewish people lived, he was quick to oblige and he showed them on one side, the lessers and the other side, the other family. They came in, they broke, in, broke the door and started to pistol whip us. We were, it's 5 a.m., we were still in bed and screaming in their hands, they had sex and they were yelling, we should throw in all our valuables, money, gold, silver, anything they could find, they were just throwing right in there. And they were beating up my father to open up the safe. While my father is opening the safe, there is a terrible, terrible screaming at our neighbor's apartment. My sister Lola and I ran out through the kitchen door, back door and back to their kitchen door to see what was going on. And when we came in, we saw this monster was holding the infant boy by its legs and swinging it and yelling to the parents, make him shut up. And of course, the parents, the daughters were all screaming, our baby, our baby, don't hurt our baby. But you can see he had a smirk on his face. He was enjoying it. And with the full force, he smashes the baby's head into a doorpost, killing it instantly. That, my friends, was only five days after occupation of Poland right after the war broke out. And we had our first taste of Nazi barbarism 
what was, was all about. Uh, of course, the whole family jumped on this monster and we were all pistol whipped, beaten down by the other Nazis and uh, uh, the other, his buddies were saying, okay, come, come on Hans, let's leave. So they took all their stuff so they gathered together all the valuables, they threw it in the truck and they took off. That was only five days after occupation of Krakow. But it didn't stop there, not my friends. Things were going on every day. There were new ordinances, new uh, laws came in. The, the, all, the, all the Jewish people had to wear a Star of David from the age of eight on, I believe. Um, and they had a curfew from seven to seven, from seven in the evening to seven in the morning, you could not go out. Now, if anyone um, broke any of these new ordinances, there was only one punishment to, for the Jewish people. There were no judges, no juries, no prisons even. All they did is they simply um, shot you. They shot you on the street. Forgive me, um, I think we lost <clears throat> contact. Um, I don't know what happened, but I lost contact with the... Um, Michael, can you bring me yeah. back? We can hear you and see you. I can't see you for some reason. Um, I don't know what happened. Um, ben, you're just talking to the audience right now. So you're, it's just going to be you on the screen right now. So the rest of us will come back on at, at the Q&A. So you can just keep talking. Everyone hears and sees you. OK, so things were, there was complete chaos in Krakow, Poland. I mean, the Jewish people couldn't believe what was going on and then people were being killed, businesses were taken away and the new ordinances came in is that every Jewish person in Krakow could no longer reside in Krakow, but they gave us a choice. The choice was you can go into the ghetto which they started the ghetto. That was the first time in history that they gave us a, gave anyone a choice like that. Or you can leave and go to a small neighboring community and uh, that was all right. But you had to leave everything behind. They only allowed you to take certain small items. And uh, my sister Lola, had, had, she was a teenager at the same time. She was about 16, maybe only 15 and a half. And she had a young man who pursued her. And he came to my father and says, Mr. Lesser, you know how I feel about Lola. Someday I'd love to marry her. But do me a favor, I will, So I, I will take care of everything for you. Why don't you and your whole family come to the small community called Nyapolomitsa where my family is moving to? I would sure like to see some faces if I could. Uh, is it possible to get it back? So Ben, the way we have this set up is that you um, you won't be able to see the audience until the Q&A, unfortunately, then you'll be able to see us, but everybody can see you and hear you fine. And um, I know it might be a little awkward, but we everybody can hear you and see you. But you know, there are certain pictures that I need to see whether it's coming on at a time. Um, and I don't see it. 
Um, I don't understand what happened. I didn't touch anything and just disappeared. So okay. I'll do my best if I have no choice. Um, Can you hear me? This is Gail. Yes, Gail. I'm sorry, Ben, just touch your mouse pad. Your screen probably went into screensaver. I did. Don't didn't. press anything, just move it. Okay, you're fine. Continue with your story. Pictures will come up at the correct time. Please continue with your story. All right, so um, by the way, I had one sister in Munkaj. My mother's side of the family comes from Munkaj. And uh, Munkaj was in Hungary at the time. My sister Goldie got stuck in Munkaj with her grandparents when the war broke out. So she stayed there during the war and um, she was pretty safe at that time. So there was my, my brother, my sister Lola and my little brother Tuli, my father, my mother and I and Goldie was in Munkaj. And when Michael offered this for my father, thank you. When Michael offered this for my father that he would take care of everything to go to a small community, my father agreed and we loaded up everything um, in the truck. It was, I'm sorry, it was a wagon. <laughs> with horse and buggy wagon and Michael helped load everything up and we were ready to leave. So that's when we found out that my father had 1000 American dollars that he saved up for a rainy day. He saved up for a rainy day. Uh, he took that money and he taped it into a safer, into a religious book, and he put it in a sack full of religious books, and we were on our way to leave. Now, a thousand American dollars was a lot of money in those days. Um, and we're now on our way. We're about an hour outside of Krakow, we're being stopped by the Nazis. Halt! And two husky Nazis jump on the wagon. And the first thing they wanted to know, do we have any religious books, Jewish literature? Of course, they saw two sacks full of books. They picked them up and heaved it on the side of the road because mo almost all the Jewish people who did not go into the ghetto had to cross this road. So now they were uh, gathering up all the religious books and they were going to have a bonfire after everybody left. Which, which, of course, they saw those books and they heaved it on top of that mountain of books. My sister Lola spoke a beautiful German. Uh, we all did, did for that matter. My mother and sisters that us kids uh, learn German. German was the language of the elite in those days. And she walks up to him and she says, you know, my father is a um, writer. He wrote his autobiography. Let him keep this one book and this Nazi, I guess he was impressed by the way she spoke a beautiful German. He says, okay, we'll give you five minutes if you can find it. So we all started to climb on this mountain of books. Now, if you, all these books were leather bound and when you climb on the, these books, it keeps sliding down. Uh, after five minutes, he chased us away and we didn't have the book. So here's my father with a family of six. There were six of us together. Actually, we were seven, but my oldest sister was a Munkaj. So how is he gonna feed the whole family? It was 
you couldn't recognize my father. It wasn't the same man. And we arrived to Nepalomitsa, to the small community where Michael made the arrangements. And when we arrived there um, to this farmhouse that he rented, now half was uh, where we lived and the other half was where the farmer lived. He was an apple orchard farmer. He lived on the other side. And uh, between the two apartments, there was an oven, a baking oven. People used to bake their own bread. When my father saw the oven, he felt a little better. And then my future brother-in-law heard what happened to all his money. He brought him a sack full of flour, a hundred pounds of flour, figuring he'll be able to bake bread to feed the family. When my father saw the flour, his face lit up. Instead of baking bread to feed the family, he baked pretzels. Why pretzels? All you need for pretzels is flour, water, and salt. Those ingredients he had. So he started to bake pretzels. Then he took the pretzels to the neighboring bars and offered it for sale and it was a novelty, I guess, they started to buy. So now he had a few zlotis where he could bake bread for the family. And before we knew it, uh, we became little bakers in this town. I don't know where my father took this talent. He baked cookies and breads and for Passover matzahs. So we lived there for a little over a year, and me, while Lola and Michael get married. Um, and after they got married, they moved out from, from our house, and they moved into a duplex. One side of the duplex was the owner who happened to be the mayor of Nepalomitsa, the mayor of this community, and the other side was Michael and Lola. One day the mayor comes home, he says, Michael, Lola, save yourselves. I heard the rumors that there's going to be a raid against the Jewish people. Excuse me for a minute. Um, Fatima, can you close the air conditioner? It's feeling cold here. Yes, this picture that you see is the wedding picture, Michael and Lola. And, and look at this picture. The third person on my, on my left, that's me. I was about 12 years old. It's the only picture they have of me. My mother and my little brother are also there. There's my little brother in the white suit and my mother. Strange, however, from all these people that you see in this photograph, only three of us survived. Lola and Michael and I. All the rest of the people were all slaughtered by the Nazis. When Michael heard that he rented a, uh, he hired a wagon with a driver, horse and buggy, in the middle of the night, we snuck out from our apartments and put whatever belongings we could put in there and we left. Now, the only place we could go was into Bochnia ghetto. Bochnia was a, the closest ghetto that we can go to, and there was a ghetto. So the only problem was that Bochnia ghetto had a very bad reputation. Every so often, two or three dump trucks would come into the ghetto in the middle of the night 
and they would go from house to house and pull out the children from their beds and throw them into these dump trucks. Of course, you can imagine the parents were screaming for the children, the children screaming for the parents. And as they filled up the, the three or four dump trucks, they started to pull out of the ghetto. Obviously, the parents were running behind these strong trucks and screaming for their children. But these cultured, educated people had machine guns at the end of each truck. And as the parents were running behind these trucks, they would open these machine guns and, and, and mow down the parents in front of their children. Of course, no one ever heard of these kids. You can just imagine what happened to them. Uh, but we had no choice. We had to go into Bochnia ghetto or remain in Nepalomice. And Nepalomice, a good thing we did leave because that night in Nepalomice, there was a roundup of all the Jewish people. They took him to the forest, made them, gave him shovels, made them dig their own graves, and everyone was shot. We found this out after the war when we went to Nepalomice, and some of the farmers who went to the forest early in the morning or at night to pick berries and mushrooms to sell in the market, they were hiding behind trees and they saw all of this happening. And this is what they told us happened there. But we had no choice. We went into Bochnia and in Bochnia, to give you an idea how living conditions were in Bochnia. Once we came in, they gave us a place to live in one big room and there were eight other people in there. So there were now four of us plus eight. Now my sister and, and Lola and Michael and his parents, they went to another apartment, but we were allocated to live with these eight people. And it was pretty crowded. There were no beds. The only thing we had was on the floor was straw and there were blankets on top of the straw and there were blankets dividing each family hanging from the ceiling. Uh, there was a stove, a little table, boxes for chairs, um, and they had one armoire where you hang your coats. And it was kind of strange because this, this was an ornate piece of furniture and everything else was junky, but I didn't pay attention to this. In the ghetto, everyone had to work. I, I was about 12 and a half at the time. I had to work. My little brother, of course, didn't work. But if you didn't work, you didn't get any rations. So we had to share with our rations with my rest of the family. My, my job was I worked in a uniform factory sewing up buttons on uniforms. It was easy work, but working. Nevertheless, he had to work about 10 hours a day. And one day, my sister Lola and Michael are told by a friendly capo, a capo is a Jewish policeman uh, who happened to know them because um, Michael, went to yeshiva, he went to school together with one of those couples. And he tells Michael, he says, Michael, I heard there's, again, some kind of rumors that tonight or tomorrow night, there'll be a raid in the ghetto. So save yourselves. Now, ever since the times that these trucks would pull into the ghetto and, and pull out the children from their bed, Every house and every apartment had a hiding place. They called it 
bunkers. That's when I found out this ornate piece of furniture was our bunker. As you open the door, you slid all the closing apart, the back panel would slide apart, and there was a hole in the wall. 12 of us could crawl through that hole and stand between two buildings. Luckily, both of those buildings were connected by exterior wall, but the ceiling, um, uh, the this, this sky was an opening. And it was winter time, it was snowing, it was very cold. And we stood there freezing, holding each other uh, all night long, we heard screaming and dogs barking, shooting, all of this going on. Towards morning, there was a little quiet and it was quiet. One of us dared to go out and check. And then he told us, okay, the coast is clear. And as we came out and what we saw outside is a scene we will never forget. There were bodies laying all over, dead bodies. Some people were torn apart by dogs. You see mothers hold, holding their infants. And there were push people going around with push cards and picking up these pieces of bodies and bodies and piling it on push cards and taking it, taking it to the ghetto square and they piled up these dead bodies as high as they could. And these cultured people came with gas cans and they poured gasoline over the bodies and they started a bonfire in the middle of the ghetto square. What went on there is unbelievable. My sister Lola and her husband they were hiding in a dog house. Yes, you heard right, the dog house. As you picked out the floor, there was a step ladder where you can go down and inside they had provisions for seven people. And anyway, uh, it turned out there were nine and only seven could fit. So Lola and Michael decided to stay out and they walked the street while the other seven went down there. And anyway, uh, they survived, but those seven people were all discovered. And somehow or another, they found out about the doghouse and they pulled everybody out and everyone was shot. Um, everyone was laying in the snow. You can see with the bullet hole in their head. Well, I could, yeah, this, by the way, those pictures that you see were all painted by my sister Lola. She is, an, she was an artist, beautiful paintings that she had. And all this was done from memory. And uh, she did that in 1950, imagine. Um, and most of these pictures are in Yad Vashem displayed. Excuse me. I can talk about what happened and Lola and Michael, they knew they had to bury the people because according to the Jewish religion is supposed to bury he loved once within 12 to 24 hours. Michael found a wheelbarrow and he put the family there. Then they went, they found a shovel in the cemetery up the hill and they buried the family. To continue telling you the story about Bochnia would take a very long time. I'm going to skip it because I don't think I have two hours or longer to talk about this. So. It is, everything is in my book. And this is my book, by the way, Living a Life That Matters from Nazi Nightmare to American Dream by Ben Lesser. Um, I highly recommend it. Um, the whole story is really in my book. 
plus some, because there's a lot that I can't um, talk about now. I don't have that much time. It would take over two hours. So somehow or another, we were able to escape the ghetto. And that was not an easy, that was not easy, but somehow we escaped the ghetto and we were outside the ghetto when Michael made arrangements with the truck driver to make his coal truck, where he was hauling coal, to, to make his coal truck into a double decker between the um, coal and the chassis, um, there was room for 10 people to lay like sardines and he would take us across to the border between Czechoslovakia and Poland. And from there, we had to smuggle across the border, which was not easy to smuggle across the border into Czechoslovakia. And to give you just an idea, we had to do this in the middle of the night at 3 a.m. Um, because the smuggler who met us in the forest, uh, he told us that the guards were changing at 3 a.m. So these guards on top of the hill with their dogs would go down and they would go to the uh, below and they would meet fresh soldiers and the fresh, they had a little ceremony, the fresh ones would come up. But in between time, there was a few minutes that you can, you're not guarded over those few minutes. During those few minutes, we were able to cross. And I had my little brother with me and we crossed, we had to um, uh, right on the other side of the barbed wire where the border was, there was a big ravine and I was holding my little brother. We slid down this ravine and then we came to a um, bottom to, and, and we were stopped. Um, we were able to be blocked there by a mountain and we stopped and it's so pitch black, we couldn't see our hands. And all of a sudden somebody punches me on my, shoulder. He says, Bainish? I almost jumped out of my skin. Who is in the middle of wilderness here uh, calling me by my Yiddish name? Uh, only my parents would usually call me by this name. Everyone else called me Ben Benek. Um, but he says to me, I am your uncle Belo, your mother's brother. How did you know where to find me? How did you know where I am? So he says, well, my, um, that you told me that my sister Lola and Michael, they crossed the same line, the same border a few days earlier. And so they were able to tell them exactly where to wait for us. And anyway, we did. Then we had to cross an order, other border. So again, this is a too long of a story. We had to cross the border from Czechoslovakia to, to Hungary. And Hungary, once we came there, and my, I met my uncle, and they took us to Budapest. And my sister Lola and Michael were already waiting for us at Budapest. We had a good meal. And from there, we had to travel by train to go to Munkaj, where my oldest sister and my grandparents, my mother's side of the family, they all lived in Munkaj. My uncles, my cousins, my aunts, they all waited for us. And when we arrived, of course, we were so happy to see each other. And my parents, my father and mother were supposed to follow um, they were supposed to follow us a couple of days later, but they never arrived. And then we found out 
that when they went into that cold rock, um, as, as they were going in the country, cold rock, some farmer saw what was going on, a Polish farmer, and he called the authorities and they came, they pulled everybody out of the truck and they lined everyone out. There was 10 of us, 10 people. And uh, of course the driver who wasn't even Jewish, all 11 were shot and they were all buried in a mass grave by a Jewish couple who survived the war. He told us exactly where he buried them. So anyway, we are here now in Munkaj. It's a free country. And I tell everyone what's happening in Krakow and what's happening in Poland. And most of the Hungarian Jewish people did not believe it. Oh, and some of them did believe, but they said, look, it will never happen in Hungary because Hungary is an ally of Germany. So uh, why would Hitler siphon off soldiers from the front to occupy a friendly country? And it, it didn't make sense. But my uncle, who, who uh, asked me and my little brother to stay in his house with his two sons, um, believed me. He was a very wealthy man. He had a store where he was selling yardage good uh, for dresses and suits. Um, and his house was above the store. And he believed me. One day he comes home and he brings home boxes of shoes. And he tells us in the heels of the shoes, there are diamonds. Be aware of this. Use it only in a life-threatening situation. If you can save your life, know that in the heels of your shoes, there are diamonds. And sure enough, in March, yeah, in March of 1944, the Nazis just marched right into Hungary like they were invited guests. And when they came into Hungary, they knew every Jewish man, where they lived, their addresses, their education, their uh, ages. Uh, they knew everything, their businesses. How, how come? They had no computers in those days, but IBM had punch cards and they were selling these punch cards to anyone who would pay the price. They don't deny it. They claim they had no idea for what purpose they're gonna use these punch cards. So they sold it to the Nazis. And I guess the only reason the, that Hitler occupied Hungary was because there were 750,000 Jewish inhabitants in Hungary. And to Hitler, killing Jews at that point was more important than winning the war. I guess he must have known that he's losing the war at that point. And it only took two months and in April, at the end of April, they were already transporting us to the death camps. And this is what they told us. They told us that we were all going to be relocated to Germany because Germany needs workers. Able-bodied men and women will be working in Germany. And uh, and, and children will, will be schooled and older people will be cared for. Bring along all your valuables that you can carry, but leave everything else behind. And sure enough, they started to march us out and everyone was, they, most people believed it because it made a lot of sense is that Germany needed workers because the soldiers were all fighting. So they did. 
So it brought us into a um, into a brick factory, which was right next to the railroad station. And they had cattle cars waiting for us. They laid, lined us up 82 cattle cars and they told us to get in onto the cattle cars. While we were waiting to get in the cattle car, just before we started to get in, uh, I, we see two men carrying a stretcher and they bring the stretcher right next to me and to my uncle, my cousin. And I take a look, there just was a beaten up woman. And I take a look, it's my sister Goldie. I couldn't recognize her. She was all bloodied and black and blue. Goldie, what happened to you? She says she tried to escape. She went as far as the railroad station and a Hungarian gendarme recognized her because he went to school with her. And he turned her in to the Gestapo and they beat her to a pulp. So now, now we're pushed in 80 people to this kettle car. It was so crowded, what can I tell you? If you wanted to sit down, it was impossible. Someone else had to stand up. It wouldn't have been so bad if we didn't have all these bundles, but these people were, everyone had a bundle. And because of this, there was no room, no room. And after a while, uh, we only had two buckets of water. The water was gone. There were no sanitary facilities, no toilets, no sun, no. And people were using those buckets now to use it to relieve themselves. And after the buckets got filled up, it would overflow <clears throat> and it would slush all over the floors. We were now happy we had bundles to sit on instead of sitting on the floor. One day, two day, three days. To describe the, the conditions inside these cattle cars, I can't even do it. It was impossible. People were uh, screaming yelling, there were older people, babies, uh, pregnant women, uh, screaming, yelling. And two days, three days, and after the third day on the third night, we arrived at a place and it said Birkenau. No, I'm sorry. It said Auschwitz, Auschwitz Polish Auschwitz. Now, we didn't know what Auschwitz was. And the train didn't stop there. It continued for another three kilometers. And then it stopped and it stopped in a camp. We can see barracks there. And uh, there was a gate on top of the gate that said, Arbeit macht frei. Labor gives you freedom. So that made sense. It's a labor camp. But the train didn't st stay there for an hour or so, and then it started to move again and move for another three kilometers. And then it was still nighttime. They opened the gate and they yelled that everyone should come out. Uh, Raus, Raus Schnell, and they had dogs and the Nazis with the dogs screaming and barking, everybody out and they were men in, in, in striped uniforms, inmates that were yelling in different languages, leave all your belonging where it is. Don't you pick anything up. Women and children to the right and men to the left. I'm holding on to my sister Goldie and my little brother Tully and they're just being pulled apart from me and they're taken to the right, and I am going to the left, 
I was about 15 and a half years old at the time. I wasn't a child and I wasn't a man either. So I decided to go with my uncle and my cousin. Why? Why did I decide to go with the man instead of with the, my sister and my little brother? I figured if this is a labor camp, they want you to labor. And if you labor, they'll probably feed you better. So I decided to go with my uncle. And we're now lined up and sort of moving along little by little. And we see these five chimneys, four or five chimneys with flame shooting out of these buildings, out of the chimneys. Uh, and ashes are flying all over the place. And every time you make a step, just like a snow, you leave a footprint in ashes, a funny smell. And the men ahead of us were saying, oh, those, those must be smelting factories. This is probably where we will be working. Nobody knew who had an idea that these ashes that we see falling all over us are the ashes of our dear departed ones, our loved ones. No one knew. No one could imagine such a thing. And I see a man standing in front, uh, a little ways down, and he, a white frog, like a doctor, he was wearing a white glove, and he goes with his finger, right, left, right, left, right, left. He's directing people. And when we came close enough, every once in a while, he would ask somebody a question. And we came close enough, I heard him ask a young man, counts to five kilometers laufen, can you run five kilometers or would you rather go by truck? And he said he had a bad knee, he would rather go by truck. Poor soul not realizing that meant certain death. And they send them to the right. My sister, Goldie, and my little brother, they went to the right too. They went directly to the gas chambers. I didn't know, but I'm going with my uncle. And when I heard them ask this question, I figured to myself, that doesn't make sense. We're in a camp, I can see barracks. Why would he ask if you can run five kilometers? I figured he is testing to see if we're strong enough to work. So I instructed my uncle and my cousin. I says, let me go first because I spoke German. And whatever he asks you, tell him, yes, you can run. Yes, you're healthy, you can work. But let me go first. And I went first and I came in front of this doctor. And later I found out that was Dr. Mengele. He was considered the angel of death. He decided who shall live or who shall die by a flick of his finger. So I stretched myself out and I saluted him. And I said, 18 Jahre alt, gesund und arbeitsfähig. I'm 18 years old, I'm healthy and I can work. So he asked me, kannst du fünf Kilometers laufen? I said, yeah, well, I can run five kilometers. He sent me to the left. My uncle and cousin both followed me to the left. And they started to uh, march us. And they marched us to a big auditorium. And they told everyone to get on the rest, get out of your shoes, get out of your clothes and walk over to the line of barbers. They had a line of inmates 
with clippers in their hand and they ordered us to go there, they'll cut our hair. But in my shoes, I had these diamonds. And my uncle who gave me the diamonds and his son, they got out of the shoes because we were ordered to get out. And I decided, no, I'm not getting out of my shoes. I'm going to keep them because of the diamonds. And I go to these barbers, they clipped me all over. They weren't exactly gentle the way they clipped us. And then they sent us to a bed house. Um, the, the room next door was a big room in the bed house. And I still had my black shoes on and no one said a word. No one said a word. And after a while, they closed the door and people started screaming. I didn't know why they screamed. I guess some people knew about the gas chambers. They knew these spigots where water was supposed to come out, would come out gas to kill us. But when the water came out, it got quiet and everyone took a shower. I still had my shoes on and I showered with my shoes. They, they told us to go over there to get the striped uniforms and there were inmates giving us those striped uniforms. And um, I, I got the rest. They also gave us a pair of shoes. The shoes were kind of canvas on top with wooden soles and heel. But I put those shoes on and I put my black shoes under my arm under my jacket and they walked us out of the bad house to the barracks and they marched us out to the barrack. It was still nighttime um, and the Struben eldest, the man in charge of the barrack comes out and he counts us and he talks to us in a broken German I could tell that he was, um, I, could, I could tell that he was Polish. So I, um, I, I go to him. No, he, he, he tells us the story. He says, ha, huh, you Hungarian Jews, you think you're here on vacation? Think again. You see those chimneys, those ashes flying out of there. Those are your mothers, your fathers, your brothers, and your sisters. And if you don't behave and do exactly what you're told, this is how you're going to bind up ashes. Anyway, my dear friends, I'm running short on time. So I'm going to skip, skip, skip what I went through in Auschwitz. Unbelievable two weeks. Um, we didn't work. We were just morning and evening. We had to go out naked on a pell, and they counted us. And to tell you what we went through there is unbelievable. And uh, while we were there, we found out what was going on in Auschwitz and how they had to kill 4,500 or over 5,000 people every every. Uh, every every uh, day, every day of the week, they had to kill so many people. And these transports were coming in fast and furious. I don't have the time to tell you the details about the gas chambers or the, the ovens. Um, but after about two weeks of going living in hell, they put us in trucks and they uh, took us to a labor camp. The labor camp was called Dernhau. Dernhau was a rock quarry, very hard labor. Um, the job that we had to do is in a, as they dynamited the mountain and boulders were coming down, 
was our job with sledgehammers to break it down into manageable pieces, throw it into mining carts, and then run it down the hill to a grinding machine where they um, where they ground it up into gravel and then push these carts back up. It was backbreaking work. I knew that my uncle is not going to survive this. So I bribed the kitchen chef, uh, who was an inmate, with my diamonds to give my uncle a job in the kitchen. And he did. And when my uncle was working the kitchen, it got a little easier for him, easier for us, because he was able to share his ration with us. He ate in the kitchen. So now we are in every day, um, my uncle is working and every day we work very hard. And on the way back, when we came back into the camp, they would line us up and they would count us. One day when we came back, they counted and counted and counted. They wouldn't let us go. The commandant comes down with his Fräulein. He says, I'm going to teach the Schweinhund a lesson. They'll never forget. What happened? Three of the inmates escaped. And because of this, he orders every 10th person in line to be pulled out to receive 25 lashes. And as they're, as they're counting every every 10th person in line, I could see my uncle who was in front of me said he would be number 10. So I switched with him and I pushed him behind me and I took his place and I became a number 10. They took us 10 in the middle of the yard and they ordered the henchmen to bring down stakes, hardwood stakes, uh, one by one, maybe two and a half feet long. And they brought down a sawhorse that you see here on the photograph. They brought down a sawhorse like this, and this is what he orders us to do. Tiptoe, put your knees inside the opening of the sawhorse, bend over, over the two by four. One man would hold your trousers real tight while the other one does the hitting, and you have to count out loud. If you miscount it, you start from one again. Anytime you touch with your stomach the two by four on that sawhorse, you start from one again. If your heel touched the ground, you start from one again. It was impossible. I was number four in line. And the first one went up. Of course, he miscounted and he started and all were over again. Finally, he fell down. When he fell down, the commandant goes over and he kicks him in the face. He says, get up. The poor guy couldn't get up. The commandant pulls out the revolver and shoots him right in the temple. He kills him. Um, when he does that, his Fräulein, his girlfriend, walks over to him, gives him a hug and a kiss like he had just performed a heroic act and then number two goes up. Number two also fell apart. He couldn't do it. He miscounted. Finally, he fell. The commandant goes over. Get up. He couldn't. He shoots him in the hand. So we have two dead people here. I was number four. There was another man in front of me who was a little younger, and he miscounted, he touched with the heel on the ground, he touched the two by four. Finally, he was yelling out, have mercy on me, don't kill me. So the commandant says to him, then come over here and face me. Poor guy stands up and makes three or four steps and his knees gave out from under him and he fell. The minute he fell, the commandant goes over and shoots him. Now Ben Lesser is number four. I, 
I, I remember talking to myself, not exactly what I said to myself, but I said, Ben, this is it. If you want to live in other uh, hour, you have to do exactly what you're told. And I walk up, tiptoe, put my knee inside the opening, bend over the two by four without touching it. One man is pulling my trouser, the other one is hitting, and I'm counting. Eins, zwei, drei, vier, fünf, six, seven. Finally, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 25, I made it. When I made it, you can hear a pin drop in the whole camp because no one believed that anyone would survive this. So the man who was, he was an inmate who was holding my trousers real tight, tells me in Yiddish, go over and thank him. So I stand up, blood's running down my trousers, and I'm walking over to him, and I saluted him, and I say, Danke schön, Herr Kommandant. When he hears that, he pulls, puts his hand on my shirt collar, twists me around facing those number 10s who are still to be beaten. And he says, now I told you it could be done. If you do it like this, Junge, you have nothing to worry about. While this is going on, there's a commotion at the gate. They caught those three inmates and they're pulling them in. You couldn't recognize them. When the commandant saw that, just like a child who gets sick of a toy, he tells us number 10 to go back in our lines. And he orders his henchmen to bring down a portable gallow and they hung all four of them one at a time. I'm sorry, all three of them, one, on, one, on, one at a time. They hung, they, they hung him. I'll never forget the last one. The last one must have been religious because when they put the noose around him, he started to say a prayer. Shema Yisrael, Adushem Alekeinu. And when they heard it, they kicked the stool out from under him. They wouldn't let him complete two more words in the prayer. Adushem Echad. They wouldn't let him finish it. There were such sadists. And then, of course, they dismissed us. We went for our rations. We went to take a shower. Don't ask. For weeks, I could not lay on my back. But I'm OK now. And uh, from that point on, uh, it took a little while longer. All of a sudden, in the middle of the night, we hear cannon fire. The front was closing in. As that morning, as we reported to go to work, there was a loudspeaker saying that no one is going to work today. The camp is being evacuated. Line up in rows of fives, and they started to march us out. And as they're marching us out, our uncle was already in the kitchen working. We couldn't even say goodbye to him. We never, of course, saw him again. And there, they call that the death march. Why they call it the death march? If you could not keep up pace with the soldiers marching, they simply shot you. And all day long, you heard pop, 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 people being shot. And one week, two weeks, after two weeks, there was still snow on the ground. Both of our shoes fell apart, my cousins and mine fell apart. Now we're barefooted and we're walking in the snow and we had to keep up pace because if you slow down, they'll kill you. For another week, we're walking in the snow, marching, and we arrived to Buchenwald. And in Buchenwald, they line us up and they told us to go into this barrack after they counted us into this barrack. They'll feed you there. They'll give you fresh clothes. And afterwards, you can, um, 
they'll feed you and you can take a shower, which is we did. In fact, to take a shower, we'll tell you the story about this picture some other time because I'm running out of short of time. But tomorrow morning, they ordered us to be back in the same place because Buchenwald is also being evacuated. So in the morning, we lined up, they counted us, and they marched us out. About 300 feet out of the camp, we see cattle cars lined up again. They line us up, 82 cattle car, they ordered us to go in. I tell my cousin, I'll push you in and get a spot against the wall because I remember in going to Auschwitz, I was in the middle, people all around me, it was terrible. I says, at least we can rest our back against something. And he did, he found a good spot and he saved the spot for me. And we went in, they closed the door. An hour later, they opened it up again and they threw in 80 breaths. 80 breaths, you can imagine what happened. Those people in front of the, the door were grabbing three or four breads or five breads. And I was against the wall with my cousin. We had none. We don't know where we're going for how long. I knew I had to get a bread. So I started to climb over the sitting inmates to get to the door to see if I can wrestle out the bread. And while I'm climbing, one of the inmates had a pocket knife and he stabs me. He didn't like the ideas that I was climbing on his head. And to this day, I still have a mark here. The mark is now over my chin. It used to be in the middle of my throat. I felt in my mouth, it's filling up with blood but I couldn't let go, I had to go get, get a bread. And I, this one man was holding four or five breads. So I pull one bread out, he punches me. And I climb back to my cousin. He says, Ben, what's happening? You're bleeding. Well, it was a miracle. One week, two weeks, people are dying all over. I had enough sense. I had this one bread in my back pocket and I, rationed it with my cousin. I gave him and me a piece the size of a half a neck every middle of the night, like at uh, 1 or 2 a.m. when nobody could see us because if they knew we had the bread, they would kill us for it. Anyway, this bread lasted for two weeks. And after two weeks, we didn't have any more. There were people dying all around us and the train kept going for another week. And we were now without bread for a whole week. And most of the people are dead. And we arrived at a place called Dachau. When we came to Dachau, they opened up the door and they said, anyone who can walk out, go across the railroad tracks into this uh, gate and to Dachau. And of course, out of our 80 people in the cattle car, maybe, maybe five of us walked out. I don't know. But we started to walk and we walked across the track and we came into Dachau. We see mountains full of dead bodies, just skeletons piled up near the next to the crematorium. Apparently, they ran out of coal to burn the bodies. So they were piling up. They put us in a, right next door, they put us in a barrack right next to the crematorium and they didn't even give us a bunk. They just let us lay on the floor next to a wall and we're laying there one day, two days, three days. Some of the inmates gave us some water and they, a little something, a crumb of bread or something. But anyway, after three days, three days we heard, Bafrayun, Bafrayun, liberation, Americans, Americans. And all I could tell you is I tell my cousin, let's go out and see what's going on. And we hold each other 
and we would come out and we see inmates crawling on their hands and knees and kissing the boots of the GIs. They looked like angels to us. Uh, God sent angels. They liberated us. So we go in the middle of the yard. Two GIs walk up to us with a can of open spam. They opened it up, spam, and they hand it to us. It smelled so good. We made a mistake. We ate some. And both of us came down with dysenteria. That night, my cousin dies in my arm from dysenteria. I, I can only tell you, I was next to dying. I, I could barely move. I barely move at that time. And so when, when he dies in my arm, they came and they took him away. When they took him away, I started to walk to follow where they're taking him. So when I followed, my knees gave out and I collapsed. When I collapsed, they pushed me against the wall. That evening, a man walks up to me, nicely dressed uh, in a suit, and he introduces himself as being the, uh, um, as being a uh, Jesuit priest. And he came with nuns and uh, doctors from France, and they're opening up a field hospital right in Dachau. And he's going to take me to the field hospital. He picks me up. He puts me on top of his shoulder like a bag of bones, which I was. I weighed about 60 pounds at them. I was already at the age of 16. And he carries me to the infirmary. And on the way, he told me something I'll never forget. He says, Benek, you people went through something terrible, so unjust, only because you're born Jewish. Uh, but don't you ever abandon your noble religion. Remember, you have a noble religion, don't you ever abandon it. I never forgot that. He took me to the infirmary. There was a nun waiting for me. They put me in a cot. They took my vitals. And then I passed out, and about two months later, I woke up in Santo Tillian. I woke up in a monastery. The, Jes the, the monks gave up one building to make it into a hospital for the survivors. And anyway, that's where I woke up. I think my time is about out. I really needed more times because I missed an awful lot. All I can tell you is I strongly recommend um, that you read my book because I became a halutz and I joined an organization. Um, we were going to became pioneers, a halutzim and to go to Palestine and fight for our country. But how I didn't go there and how I met my sister, um, my, my, only, my only surviving sister, uh, that's a story in itself. I don't have the time to tell you, but I want you to know there is so much that I already missed. And unfortunately, they give me about two hours or an hour and a half. I can't do it in an hour and a half. It would take two and a half hours or longer to tell my story. And I thank you for listening to me. Please read my book. These are some pictures of my family, my sister, uh, Lola, the only surviving sister. She passed away about approximately uh, two and a half years ago. Um, today, I'm the only survivor of a family of seven. Well, I believe that's my time is up. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Um, and Gail, you are welcome to turn your camera on as well and join us in the Q&A. 
we have, um, first, I want to share that we have so many comments of people just thanking you so much for sharing your story. One question that we have is, uh, how do you remember every detail as clearly as you do? Not really. There's an awful lot that I forgot. But the, the important points I remember, to you as a listener, it may sound like a, every detail, but there's an awful lot of details that I didn't tell you. However, it's in my book. I, I couldn't possibly tell you. I, I would be here for three and a half or four hours if I'd had. Thank you very much. Um, somebody would like to know if you could give yourself any piece of advice when you were younger, what would that, what do you think that would be? When I was younger, um, I don't know what you mean by that. Um, I lived a beautiful life and uh, I, I went to Cheder and I went to school and I went to yeshiva. I had a wonderful life. Um, so uh, advice, the only thing I can, I can tell you now is stop the hatred. The hatred has to stop because look where it leads to. And, and we have to learn to get along with each other. We can live side by side and appreciate our differences rather than hate them. Maybe we can even learn from each other something. But why hate, you know? It all started, this whole thing started with hate. Hitler and the Nazis did not start by killing. It all started with hate. And then if you hate enough, then it started with killing. So it shows you that it's an easy step from hatred to kill. And you know, there's a lot of hatred and a lot of bullying that's going on in schools today. The bullying has to stop because bullying is a form of hatred. Then Hitler and the Nazis were big bullies. And when you bully someone, you make an enemy for life. That person who was bullied will never forget you that you bullied them. And you never know what that person will do once he grows up. If, if he's not very lucky in life, he will blame you and who knows what he will do. So to avoid harm, to avoid killing, to avoid having enemies, stop the bullying. Stop the hatred. We're all, we are all God's creation. And as such, we should learn to live side by side and get along with each other. Maybe we can even learn something from each other. But don't hate, that has to stop. Thank you so much for that answer. When did you first start sharing your story with people? Actually, I started sharing my story when I came to um, Las Vegas, which was about 25 years ago, because my grandson, 
I lived in Las Vegas already, but my grandson, Adam, who lived in Los Angeles, called me up one day. He says, Papa, my teacher found out that you're a Holocaust survivor. She was wondering if you come out and talk, tell the story. Well, I didn't know what to do because before then I kept silent. For many, many years, maybe 50 years, I, my kids knew that I was a survivor, but I never went into details. I didn't want to make them feel different than any other American child. I made sure they go to a school where they mingle with all nationalities and they have friends of one. I just wanted to make sure they're a regular American child without the burden of knowing that they're different in any way. So I refused to tell him. But when my, my, my grandson asked me, I had no choice. Uh, I decided I have to go in. Now that was in fifth grade in LA. Uh, what do you tell fifth grade kids? Um, I remember going to that school the first time and when I touched the handle opening the door, it, it, was, it was, my hand was shaking. What do I do? And I opened the door and I came in and the kids were all looking at me and I started to tell the story. I came at 10 a.m. And they gave me from 10 to 11 to speak. I spoke from 10 to 11, from 11 to 12. And the kids were just glued to their chairs open and their eyes didn't stop. Sets. And then when the teacher, the, the 12 o'clock when it came lunchtime, the teacher chased them out for lunch. So going out of the classroom, Instead of the kids going to lunch, they surrounded me with questions. Those were fifth graders. I couldn't believe that. That's when I said, Ben, no, you cannot stay silent anymore. And from that day on, which was 25 years ago, I started to tell. And then when I, I came, I was already living in Las Vegas. I says, Ben, you have to write it down because someday you'll forget it. So I wrote the book and you can't, I mean, it's my book, but believe me, when you read it, it will open your eyes from whatever you heard from me today was only a small section of what's in the book. And after I finished the book, I went to schools again and I started to speak. I must have spoken to uh, many, many kids. And then I decided to give up Zachor pins. Zachor means remember, that's a Hebrew word. I'll never forget, before I started to speak, I was in Washington DC and I went to the museum and I purchased a handful of these pins. So after I spoke, I never forget one young lady comes to me and says, Mr. Lesser, what does that mean? What does this word say? So that when I told her and I asked her, do you want a pin? And I had some extra ones and I gave her a pin. She looked at it like it was something holy. And she says, Mr. Lesser, I'll cherish this pin for the rest of my life. And when I have children of my own, I will tell him that this means remember the Holocaust. There was such a thing as a Holocaust. That's when I decided, Ben, you have to make pins and give it out. And I went to a manufacturer and to date I have given out over over a half a million of these pins. And they mean something because whether you wear this pin or you keep it in the drawer, these kids will someday find it.
I don't believe they'll throw it away and they'll ask what the meaning of that pen is. And this is when the parent will tell them what it means. It means, means remember there was a Holocaust. Don't forget, I remember listening to a Holocaust survivor. So this is when I didn't stop there. I even went further than that and I opened the foundation. It's a whole Holocaust Remembrance Foundation. And to date, we go around to schools and we, we teach, we give out pens and we give out other, we even have a shout out. Um, I wonder if I have it here. The shout out means, imagine where you can go on our website and shout out for tolerance, for peace. You can even submit a photograph and that photograph with your shout out will come out. These are the shout outs here. We have given out and we have had, I would say a few hundred thousand people shouting out. And remember that shout out doesn't just go away in midair. That shout out will remain on our website for generations to come. And if you submit the photograph, your shout out and your photograph will come out. Um, even, even 20 or 30 years from now, imagine, imagine your great, great grandchildren will be able to punch in your name and out comes your picture and your shout out. So we're doing all the, these things to keep the memory alive. We cannot allow the Holocaust to be forgotten. Six million of us, six million shout outs. We're looking for six million shout outs to compensate for the six million silenced voices. And you can help. Michael, the museum in Los Angeles can help. The more people shout out, the more we like it. We cannot allow the world to, to acquire amnesia. I'm gonna interrupt, this is Gail. Can you hear me okay? Hi, I'm Ben's daughter and I um, am the director of the Zahor Holocaust Remembrance Foundation. Uh, we are, just to let you know, we are a family foundation and we have started actually because Ben needed to leave a footprint in time. And it had to be, you know, more than a book. He had to have a curriculum. He had to have the eye shout out. He wanted to make sure that his story was remembered in history and it was told. So we, as a family, we developed this foundation and um, we just finished, just recently, we just finished our curriculum. It is free to everybody. And we were also already approved by the um, Shoah Foundation. And I, it's, I invite everybody to come and, and check it out. It includes Ben's story before Holocaust, after Holocaust, how to live a life that matters afterwards. Um, it's, uh, it's very interactive. We even have Ben even has a, what's called, I don't have any notes here, so I'm just going off the top of my head. Ben even has here a um, interactive uh, timeline that we have on it. And he also has a teaching tool that you could, an AI uh, that you could ask, go online and ask him questions directly, and he will be able to answer it. And this is a type of a uh, artificial intelligence. And this will last as long as these type of computers last in our world. And um, you could, after Ben's gone, you'll be able to ask him any kind of question you want. So feel free, our site is free. We are doing it to be able to educate. 
the public and to educate future generations that the Holocaust did happen and Ben is one of the survivors of it. And I, as a second generation growing up as a child of survivor, I remember my father waking up in the middle of the night and screaming from nightmares. Or when I was really young, I remember seeing the, the marks on his back um, from, from the beating. Uh, and it wasn't until I really became an adult and my son asked him to tell a story that I really heard his full story and realized as a family, something else had to be done. And so here we are. It's a horror Holocaust um, foundation. And we also have our curriculum and everything else. And I invite you to join it. If I have a minute, um, it's called Story File. The Story File is my, like, my, my hologram. You see me there sitting and you can ask me any questions and hopefully 20 or 30 years from now, you can still do it and I will answer it. Um, I'm doing everything possible to keep the memory alive, which is something, the same thing that Michael and your, and the, the museum in Los Angeles is doing, that's all. But it's not enough. It's not enough. There are so few of us doing this. And there, every, every uh, year, there are fewer and fewer of us around to even continue to tell the story. Most of the survivors today that are really doing their talking are survivors that were children of the Holocaust. And um, their, their stories are different. But as far as survivors that were in death uh, trains, death marches, uh, you know, Ben almost went through like two Holocausts, fleeing Poland and then getting caught in Hungary. Uh, so there's many, many years there of history um, to be taught and to learn about. And I also want to make sure that the youngsters who listen to this, when they go home tonight or later this evening, that they hug and appreciate their parents. Make sure that they hug and kiss their parents because don't take them for granted. One of the things that Ben does when he goes to a school is he makes sure that the kids all bond with each other, that they hold hands and they say never again, never again. And he asks that he gives every student a pin and he asks them to go home and tell the story to their parents their family members. So the story lives on. And he also, when he gives out these pins, that student has a responsibility to pay forward the story. So, um, you know, it's, it's just not his story that's being told. Just like his book is just not a memoir. His book is much more than a memoir. It's been written almost like a textbook, parts of it. And that's it. Thank you so much. We do have just two questions for you, Ben. Um, first, when you were in the cattle car, the box car, were you able to see anything from outside or get a sense of where you were while you were inside the train? Uh, I wasn't, but there were people who were next to this little window. They had a little window of it Bob wire around it, it tiny. You couldn't couldn't fit through it. Some people were next to that window and they were telling us where we are, approximately. Uh, if they saw a sign someplace, they would say, "Oh, this is where we are." Even when we came to Auschwitz, it said Auschwitzim. We didn't know where we are. We knew we were still in Polish, in Poland someplace. Nobody heard of an Auschwitz or an Auschwitz before. Not the Hungarian people, and I came with the Hungarian people. No, most of us couldn't. There were some who were privileged because they were right next to that little opening so they can look out and, and see. Thank you very much. And what did you do after the war? What did I do after the war? 
Uh, that's a whole story in itself. Mm -hmm. I, I don't have the time. Of course, the first thing I wanted to do is catch up on my uh, education. Um, I lost my education as a child from uh, actually from sixth grade on. So I, 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 now in Germany, while I was waiting to come to America, um, we had a professor and his wife and they taught me, caught me up on a lot of things, caught us, taught me math and, and history, all of that for two, three years, I had a private tutor, that German. And I don't know how my, um, my brother-in-law and my sister even paid him. I don't know if they paid him anything, but he was the nicest man in Munich that he was meeting me every other day and teaching me. Um, and of course, when I came to America in 1947, I'll never forget uh, the minute I, I saw the Statue of Liberty, even though we couldn't read, I could read it, but I couldn't understand what it said on the Statue of Liberty. But it made, it gave us a certain sense of belonging, a feeling, seeing her holding the torch. And then when we came to the New, New York Harbor and we saw the skyline, uh, I remember saying to myself, Ben, this is day one of your life. From this day on, you will succeed. You will make a success in your life. And knock on wood, I, I can't complain. I had a tough time at the very beginning. I did go to school in New York a little and then uh, later on, I, I went to school, but uh, mostly I was privately taught. I taught myself and uh, I, I, I did so many things that I, I could tell you this for an, and this be here another couple hours. I don't think you want to give me the time. So uh, Michael, uh, there's a lot to tell, but Everything is in my book. But and I will tell you. Oh. Excuse me, my curriculum book, I just got finished with that for the same, for the very reason, because when I talk to some of the principals, they tell me, they can, I mean, I asked them, how come you stopped teaching the Holocaust? Or maybe they never even taught it. They tell me they can't afford to buy the books. And when I asked the teachers, why don't you teach the Holocaust? Mr. Lesser, we don't have the time. We're so, uh, we have so much little time for, for uh, we just don't have the time to, to teach about it. It's too cumbersome, too big. So not, this is one of the reasons why I started the curriculum book. So now, and, and it's divided in such a way so that they can teach a little bit, they can teach more, or the whole story. And it doesn't cost them anything, it's free of charge. So the, the, the principals can't complain anymore, it costs money. I was just going to add that the stories of Ben and his working are actually, a lot of them are, um, there's a lot of miracles involved in them. There's a miracle in how he found a sister after the war um, through his, and during his recovery time. There's some great stories. The story of him um, coming to America and working, selling nylons on the street, you know, uh, or, or coming to Los Angeles, very historic, places that we've all learned about from movies and such, working on Delancey Street, coming to Los Angeles and, uh, you know, and stealing look, morsels of food or sugar packets. Skidrow, when I came to Los Angeles, I was on Main Street because it was a dollar a night, the hotel. And that price I could afford until I ran out of a dollar a night and I couldn't get a job. And I ran out of buying food. 
I, I hugged and uh, all my clothing, all my watch, my wristwatch, everything went to pawn shops. And then after a while, I ran out of money to go to eat in, in a restaurant. Um, it was unbelievable living on Skid Row and, and how I was able to come out of this and make a beautiful life for myself and my family. That's a story in itself. Well, Ben and Gail, thank you both so much for joining us um, and sharing your story. We're so honored to have you both here with us. Um, we invite all of our audience to visit um, Zahor website as well, of course, as our website if you haven't already seen it. Um, again, our museum is, uh, our programs are free and while we are currently closed, we have regular virtual programs like this one. Um, Thursdays at 11 o'clock, we have survivors share their stories. Again, we thank you so much for joining us and um, ben, I want to let you know that we received so many comments during your talk with people just thanking you so much for um, for sharing your life with them and um, for giving them the inspiration and courage, as they said. So we, we're so appreciative of you thank and what you've done for us. So thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. I appreciate it. And I want to say thank you to um, the Holocaust Museum of Los Angeles. <clears throat> it's located where I grew up. I grew, I grew up, um, the school Ben spoke at the very first time, Hancock Park Elementary, which is around the corner from the museum. And um, I knew a lot of the people, a lot of my friends' parents were among those first people that brought artifacts for the museum. And it was quite, uh, it's, it's a very special place. And I hope when these doors are able to open again that you'll have a, everybody will have a chance to visit it. And we've been to a lot of museums, our favorite. Yeah. Thank you very much. We hope to welcome everyone back at the museum as soon as it's safe. But of course, in the meantime, we're doing our virtual program. So please stay tuned and follow our website and our Facebook page, social media. Thank you to the Lesser family very much. We wish everybody uh, a healthy and safe weekend.